I'm, I'm a professor of philosophy and psychology and with a particular uh, focus on um, cultural history, particularly Western cultural history, and um, the evolution of the Western worldview. Uh, and that is certainly the, um, a good part of the uh, part of the picture that I want to introduce or develop rather in this discussion. I'm also, however, a, a, a watcher of the skies, as uh, John Keats put it, uh, a close observer of the, of the planetary motions and the, um, their correlations with the archetypal patterns of human experience, as above, so below, that, that correlation, which opens up a whole new cosmos, uh, very different than the modern disenchanted worldview that most of us in this room were educated to believe was absolute. Um, in a sense, this is the, that's the night side, uh, the watcher of the night skies, that's the night side of the worldview. Well, the other side of my work, I suppose, would be more the day, the night ruled by the, the moon, the day ruled by the sun. Nietzsche uh, said, and thus spoke Zarathustra, the world is deep, deeper than day can comprehend. The world is deep, deeper than day can comprehend. In a sense, deeper than the solar consciousness by itself can comprehend. We need the solar and the lunar. Um, and oh, that reminds me, in terms of that, as the correlations between planetary movements and the archetypal patterns of human experience and what that opens up in terms of the worldview. They intimate, it's a great word, intimate, intimate, it intimate, intimations. It comes from, uh, in my use of it, from Wordsworth in that great poem, Intimations of Immortality, uh, from Recollections of Childhood, that's a great ode. Not in utter nakedness are we born, but trailing clouds of glory. It's a beautiful poem. So t today we'll try to see with both the uh, with both the uh, eye of that is opened up by the day and that by the night the clarity of the of the solar and the um, depth of the lunar night. Um, so we need both. One doesn't have to be a prophet or a clairvoyant to to see pretty clearly that we are today um, living through the end of an era, an, an, old, an old age of the world is passing away, to use a kind of Tolkien-like phrase. And, um, and clearly a new, a new world, a new age is, is striving, struggling to be born. And uh, I think it was Jung who probably described this in, in a kind of prophetic moment in the 1950s when he uh, wrote in The Undiscovered Self that famous passage where he describes the kairos, uh, the Greek word for the right moment for a great profound transformation of the symbols. So this is Jung, 19. 56 in a, an essay called The Undiscovered Self, which is that work he was writing, um, you know, in that amazing period of his last 10 years of life where he, and this is between age 75 and age 85, where he wrote so much of his most significant work, uh, Synchronicity, uh, and a causal connecting principle. He wrote Answer to Job, his most profound religious um, philosophical uh, work of historical analysis. He wrote Memories, Dreams, Reflections, um, Ion, Mysterium Conjunctionis. I, I, I keep that as an image of what you can do in your 70s and 80s. So this is Jung. A mood of universal destruction and renewal has set its mark on our age. This mood makes itself felt everywhere, politically, socially, 
and philosophically. We are living in what the Greeks called the kairos, the right moment for a metamorphosis of the gods, of the fundamental principles and symbols. This peculiarity of our time, which is certainly not of our conscious choosing, is the expression of the unconscious human within us who is changing. Coming generations will have to take account of this momentous transformation if humanity is not to destroy itself through the might of its own technology and science. So much is at stake and so much depends on the psychological constitution of the modern human being. He's got the right balance there, I think, between um, that sense of much greater forces are at work than we can control uh, and yet at the same time so much depends on us and uh, that there is a um, in fact the, the next sentence talks about does the individual know that he or she is the make weight that de determines which way the balance will go um, it takes a lot of courage a kind of spiritual courage today to look squarely at the state of the earth, the earth community, the um, extinction of species, of species the um, extreme uh, uh, climate uh, changes, the melting of the polar ice caps. I don't have to give the litany. It takes a certain um, courage of, of, of heart and spirit to to take it in, in a, with open eyes in a kind of unflinching way. <clears throat> and it's not at all uh, rare to get caught in a kind of apocalypse complex that can sort of possess one as one takes in the extent of that which is dying right now. Uh, the New York Jewish uh, philosopher Woody Allen uh, put, <laughs> put, put his uh, finger on this with his customary Schopenhauer-like clarity with, um, in a speech he gave to the graduates uh, some time ago. More than at any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other path to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. <laughs> I speak, by the way, not with any sense of futility, but with a panicky conviction of the absolute meaninglessness of existence, which could easily be misinterpreted as pessimism. <laughs> it is not. It is merely a healthy concern for the predicament of modern man. And he finishes this passage. Uh, modern man is here defined as any person born after Nietzsche's edict that God is dead. But before the hit recording, I want to hold your hand. <laughs> That's, uh, that would be between 1882 and 1963. We got it in here in 64, but they recorded it in 63. Anyway, so that's, um, that's uh, Professor Allen, who gives us uh, a few hints as to uh, what went wrong. Because in that one little passage, he uh, is able to integrate, he's able to um, show, th even unconsciously, the interconnections between, on the one hand, the very real um, biological, ecological, uh, empirical crisis of the world, but he's connecting it to a, a psychological, a, a crisis of vision, a crisis of soul, and he's grounding that in a particular worldview, which uh, is the worldview of disenchantment that N Nietzsche's uh, powerful phrase, uh, the, the death of God, or God is dead, is alluding to. The death of God is, is, is a shorthand way of saying the destruction of the metaphysical world that took place in the aftermath of the tremendous uh, empowerment of the modern rational uh, uh, 
mode of apprehending reality, a certain type of rationality, not rationality, period. There's other forms of, of reason. There's, there's uh, spir more spiritually informed forms of reason and so forth. It's not that reason is the problem. It's a certain form of rationality. So he's connecting all those things together in this uh, short little discourse. And he also, and I'm sure entirely unconsciously, is um, connecting this to a certain view of the modern human being by summing it up in the word man or modern man, which is a, a one-sidedly masculine uh, rendering of the whole human being. In some sense, one could say that the crisis is a masculine crisis. That's not quite right, though. I'd say it's a, it's a solar masculine crisis. I'd like to make the distinction between the, um, the solar lunar polarity and the masculine feminine polarity. There's a huge overlap between them. It's very important, that overlap. But there's also a distinction because there's a solar feminine as well as a lunar feminine. There's a, there's a lunar masculine as well as a solar masculine. Uh, we have that in the astrological tradition. Um, the sun is the part of us that, that seeks to be, to shine, to be that individual, that powerful single light in the sky, to be that individual he heroic um, uh, entity that is, that is shining, manifesting, being in the world, that goes out and does its, its journey, that achieves, that acts, uh, that goes uh, on its heroic arc. All of us have that in us. Um, the lunar, the moon in, in our birth charts, in our, in our being, is also central to who we are, but in a different way. Like the, the sun is is who we are. The sun is that um, sense of individual selfhood and that impulse to, of uh, the personal individual will and consciousness. But the, the moon is who we are before we even think about who we are. The moon is the, the psychosomatic ground of our being. It's our body, our soul, our, our, uh, our ancestry, our, our community. It's our relational field. Um, it's our being out of which the solar consciousness emerges. And it's not that the sun is conscious and the moon is the unconscious. That's often said too, but that's, that's also not quite right. The moon is what the solar consciousness tends to be unconscious of. That, but it is a form of consciousness. It's a more diffuse consciousness. It's a consciousness that is more in touch with the whole rather than the part. Um, it's, it's that intuitive, emotional, somatic, relational um, uh, awareness of the field. Uh, while the solar consciousness is much more focused, much more individual, um, you see this in the, the way in which when the sun shines, there's only one light that's visible. It's a very powerful light. It makes things very clear, defined, distinct. Um, but when the moon at, in the night is shining, you can see many other lights as well. In a sense, the moon is the symbol of multiplicity, while the solar is the pr principle of, 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 the, of the single. The, the, the solar monotheistic um, uh, impulse versus the lunar polytheistic is partly what we're looking at. The moon has a very special relationship to the great mother goddess as in a sense the cosmic field of the whole. Now um, when the not only are many lights visible when the, at night when the moon shines or uh, but the, the moon also has a different relationship to light and dark. It's constantly moving, uh, waning and waxing, uh, and it also permits the apprehension of the deep cosmos of the whole. During the day, you see a very limited sky. At the, in the night, you can see into the deep sky. So I'm, I'm wanting us to keep those two 
principles in mind as we're, talk, as we're going forward here. And when we think of Nietzsche's, the world is deep, deeper than day can comprehend. Um, we need day and night. We need that, that light of clarity that is the solar principle. We also need that other kind of, of um, depth of perception that is related to the, to the, the, the moon consciousness, to, the, to the, the, the night sky. One last thing on that masculine feminine uh, issue. While it seems that w women just generally seem to have more of a uh, immediate access to uh, the, all the qualities that the moon uh, rules, um, the, relate, the capacity for relationality, uh, for um, the, the intuitive apprehension of the whole, to be in touch with the one's emotions and, and body and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of good biological reasons for that. <clears throat> the very nature of the psychosomatic development of, of, of a young girl is totally different than, than, a, than a boy. And um, at the same time, uh, women, particularly in our time, are experiencing and cultivating, developing this very, uh, n this, this, this solar dimension of the feminine. And it's not like to be an individual woman who shines and achieves on her own terms, uh, to be her own center of life rather than to project that center onto, you know, the husband or, or uh, someone else. That's, um, that's not just her cultivating her inner masculine to be assertive, to be uh, self-determining, to be rational. To assign that to masculinity is in some sense a deprivation of, of the fullness of femininity and womanhood. And at the same time in men, like when a man is holding tenderly his, his, his baby, his child, um, that's not just him cultivating or uh, developing or being his feminine side, that's a, f a f side of his masculinity, but it's, it's, a, it's a relational, caring, feeling um, side, uh, which is the lunar masculine. Um, the solar masculine is more the patriarchal uh, convention and ideal, and the lunar feminine is more the, the uh, what patriarchy, I think the error, if, there is, if we can call it an error, is that is the rigidity with which the solar was just assigned to the masculine and lunar to the feminine. And this is the way you, you need to keep it separate and limited. And a woman's place is in the home, taking care of the children, that kind of uh, profound constraint um, reached this kind of breaking point in the 1960s where it's just like this um, explosion outward into the fullness of, of uh, what could be a human being, and at the same time, a compensatory uh, impulse has been at work so strongly in 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 men too. So, and, uh, and, and enough on that, because I now would like to um, attend to this larger historical um, development that we're in the midst of. You could say uh, we need to be conscious of our, of our history because history is, in certain ways, the great unconscious for a civilization. And um, I think it was the historian Daniel Burstein who said, trying to create the future without understanding the past is like trying to plant cut flowers. It's a very, it's a very telling metaphor and I think quite, quite accurate. Now, if we look back to the um, to that state of disenchantment and the you know the the, the death of the metaf the destruction of the metaphysical world that has shaped the modern consciousness since the Enlightenment, even that word the Enlightenment is a very powerful solar word. That's the one-sidedness of the solar development is very uh, clear there. All the focus is on progress. Um, the progress of the solar principle, not recognizing that larger cyclical lunar dying and being born again, the waning and waxing. And um, if we look at that disenchantment, we can see that in some sense this is the consequence of 
a certain very powerful one-sided development of the Western and modern self. And there's so much about the West and about modernity that is um, not only like it's not only valuable, but it's it's admirable. Um, I want to emphasize how much the, the, that Western civilization and modernity have brought forth so much that is precious to us in this room, and I don't just mean you know iPhones and hot showers and and so forth, but I, I'm the, the technological, uh, global interconnectedness, and so forth, medicine, anesthetics, etc. Um, many positive things that we, uh, modern medicine, uh, that we are um, appreciative of in crises and so forth, are so valuable to us. But it's more than that. There's a nobility to the to the Western um, tradition that goes back to the ancient um, Greek philosophers, to the to the uh, Hebrew prophets, that image of the, of the divine that comes in through the Hebrew prophets and comes in through Christianity that is moving, seeing history itself as a movement of the divine in the world with human responsibility for its unfolding. There's a direct line that goes right through to Martin Luther King and uh, the, the, the quest to realize justice in this world. Um, and uh, there's a dynamism, there's a heroism, there's a brilliance to, to the Western and modern project. It's a, it's a Promethean light of tremendous uh, uh, intensity and, and dynamic power. But what a shadow that light has cast. What suffering has been caused by uh, that juggernaut for other peoples, for other cultures, other religions, um, for also other forms of life. So much of the, of the um, biosphere of the Earth community has been so profoundly affected, destroyed by this powerful um, one-sided development that in its one could see it really as being, in retrospect, what the modern mind thought it was doing in objectifying the world and saying that reality is what we can um, uh, sense and measure uh, quantitatively and um, understand rationally and develop and exploit. That um, entire approach to the nature of matter, of the earth, of nature, of reality, is uh, grounded in a certain psychology of being in, that is unconscious in the modern mind and in the modern self. It's an, it's an unconsciousness of how much in the effort to see the way things are just as objects, it has objectified and removed the, subjective, the subjectivity, the interiority of all the rest of reality so that only human beings are seen as having interiority. Only human beings are seen as having consciousness, conscious intelligence, the capacity for meaning, for purpose. These are seen as being human attributes and the world itself, the cosmos, out of which we emerge is seen as being purposeless without intrinsic meaning. This, in retrospect, we can see that the disenchantment of the world, of the modern cosmos, has essentially been a projection of the modern self's will to power. It's the shadow of, of our will to power. And the consequences of that are enormous because when you when you have a disenchanted universe, then literally nothing is sacred. It's desacralized, the whole cosmos. Therefore, everything can be used, appropriated for profit and power, everything. Um, and all you have to do is turn on television for an, uh, a half an hour and watch how everything 
like just in commercials, for example, advertisements, whatever it is, beautiful vistas of nature, noble works of compositions of music, the beautiful human um, body, all these are appropriated to sell products. And then um, ancient forests can be seen as nothing more than commodities of lumber that, uh, and children's minds can be seen as essentially marketing targets and indigenous tribes can be seen as outmoded relics of a, of a past that needs to be pushed aside for progress to occur. Um, and mountains could be seen not as sacred but as mining sites and, and offshore drilling it, it, it totally changes what the sea is seen as being valuable for. It's an objectification of the world. And the problem, when you combine that uh, exploitative juggernaut against the world with the spiritual hunger that comes, the emptiness that comes from living in a disenchanted world where there, that is ultimately seen as without intrinsic purpose or meaning, there's a, an, an impulse to attempt to fill that void with the only thing that that form of self, of, of psyche knows, uh, and that's material goods. And so a kind of consumerism combines with this um, corporate uh, technocratic cannibalizing of the globe. Uh, and it moves at a tremendous pace, which we are now seeing the, 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 the critical stages of. We've never seen ever in history a civilization that has done this experiment, which is to go decade after decade, century after century, under the conviction that the world itself, the cosmos, is intrinsically meaningless and purposeless, and that only the human being uh, is the source of any meaning and purpose in the world. Um, so uh, this is the, this is the um, in many ways, the, the turning point that we're at, because you can see how uh, nothing reconfigures, nothing has the power to reconfigure moral values than a mortal crisis, a near-death experience. And in some ways, and here I, I would um, uh, agree with the point that Daniel was making earlier today how much um, it seems as if whether we could say it's the human being that's doing this or perhaps the cosmos itself um, we're constellating a an initiatory encounter with planetary mortality that in some sense is uh, effectively producing a shamanic descent and transformation. And this is perhaps exactly what most needs to happen. Uh, there's, you know, that famous sentence by H.G. Wells, we're in a race between education and catastrophe. Uh, I would rephrase that, that we're in a race between initiation and catastrophe. In, in Joseph Campbell's um, kind of sum, summation of the initiatory, uh, writes a passage. He emphasizes how much there's a, uh, and he's drawing on uh, many others' work, anthropologists and so forth, but his point, his main uh, narrative description is that the, the initiate is basically removed from the tribe, separated from the whole, from the mothers, from the tribal community, and is put through a, a, a series of ordeals put through a crisis of meaning, a deconstruction of the old identity, an encounter with mortality, uh, often intense suffering, even of a physical kind. And uh, this, this crisis is precisely what is necessary to allow the uh, person to come into contact with the deepest archetypal sources of meaning that inform life and death. And that is the death rebirth mystery. As a result of going, of entering deeply into that experience, there's a, a, a destruction of the old self and of the old worldview. 
and a movement uh, back into the world with a new sense of identity that is grounded in some sense in the depths of the whole. And one is no longer so much trying to prove oneself. One is one's own deepest aspirations are coming from the depths of the world itself. And one is serving the whole rather than serving the part. I love that, um, that sentence from Joanna Macy, you know, uh, uh, talking about elders. Here's another uh, great elder. She just turned 80 in the last year. Um, another great elder who um, perfectly, you know, a, a great writer can in one sentence summarize a very complex reality and, and, and with great simplicity. And she was uh, addressing the whole issue of how should we um, direct our activities given the fact that there are so many things that we could direct them to and you know should we save the whales or should we work on behalf of uh, 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 hungry children and, and so forth and she says basically uh, everything is so interconnected that whatever you are doing is in some sense going to be helping uh, the whole. And the, the point is to give yourself with as much, um, what, whatever it is that is most uh, drawing you from your own intrinsic depths of um, uh, authenticity that, you know, to go back to Joe Campbell, the following your bliss, that's the, that's the passion that is you, that where you f are feeling most fulfilled. That's what's going to carry you into, into serving the whole in the best way. And she summed this up by saying, the truth is that all aspects of the current crisis reflect the same mistake, setting ourselves apart and using others for our gain. <clears throat> And then she goes on, so to heal one aspect helps the others to heal as well. Just find what you love to work on and take joy in that. Never try to do it alone. Link up with others. You'll spark with each other's ideas and sustain uh, each other's energy, which I think is exactly what we're doing here. Now, when we uh, look at the mystery of the uh, evolution of the Western uh, consciousness and that, and I'm emphasizing the West, not because it's the best or the most important, obviously, uh, somehow that this is where true civilization is, that typical Eurocentric or uh, later North American Eurocentric Western hubris. Far f the opposite of that, we all in this room have, I think, a profound awareness of the um, deep spiritual wisdom that was cut off uh, by the whole uh, Western development. And yet, if we don't understand the West, we are not going to be in a position to make a difference in the world today because the assumptions and operating principles that inform Western civilization and modern civilization in particular are affecting every part of the globe now. The most distant South Pacific island or uh, Arctic iceberg uh, is being affected by, by the modern um, mind. And we need to grasp this, this modern mind if we are to go forward. We also, many of us in this room, are uh, Western by our um, inheritance. And there's an elder's tradition there, too. And there's a lineage that we need to know. There's a, we need to know our, our ancestors. We need to, in some sense, uh, pay attention to what's going on in the today for the West, partly for our children's sake, because which way the West goes is going to have huge influence on the whole and the future. But also, uh, as part of a kind of fidelity to, the, to, the, to our own ancestry. And this brings up the 
point that I think is sometimes insufficiently recognized in a, in a community such as our own, which is so rightly critical of modernity. Um, and that is, if we truly believe that everything is uh, part of the whole, every, that the whole informs everything, that nothing is um, ultimately separate from the one, then that is also true of the modern. And that there may be a way in which the whole modern development is also some, an expression, perhaps even an important expression of the whole. And when we look at this, I mean, think about how much in this room, each of us in this room has valued going our own path in life, being an individual that questioned the assumptions of our um, parents or church or um, conventional worldview that we are taught or, uh, and so forth. That's, that in many ways is, is a legacy um, of the Western development that comes from the Hebrew prophets and the Greek uh, philosophers who were, who were loyal to their tradition by questioning it. It's, it's a tradition that values uh, independence of judgment and questioning the past in order to go forward. And um, I think uh, the, the capacity to change worldviews and to, and to synthesize multiple worldviews and to take in different perspectives and not simply live within the absolutely certain culturally sanctioned worldview that has been passed on for many, many generations, that's, that's something that is um, very new for thousands and thousands of years human beings did not experience that multiplicity or that autonomy or that uncertainty, therefore, or that, that responsibility. So we've got a lot that goes into this package that we're, we're given. I think if we uh, consider the mystery of, of why this disenchantment of the world may have happened, and how disenchantment, cosmic, cosmological disenchantment went hand in hand with the empowerment of the individual self and the empowerment of the autonomous rational intelligence. I think we can see that in some ways it looks as if there's been a long, long um, constellating, developing of of, a, of an individual self that experienced a separation from the whole and is now going through, after much growth and development and triumph, is now in some sense going through a descent. And if we get back to the solar and the lunar, we can see that part of the great um, myopia of modernity was to think only in terms of progress and only in terms of the heroic ascent. There's been a lot of criticism of the hero, the hero archetype in our time um, by archetypal psychologists, Jungians, um, feminists. Uh, many people have accurately discerned this shadow side of the modern lone cowboy uh, heroic ego that has, uh, that in a way is the legacy of the solar monotheistic um, uh, worldview that constellated it. That's why we have a phrase like the, the Cartesian solar monotheistic ego. <laughs> See, it's See how we're combining a lot of, I mean, there's, there's, there's religion, there's psychology, there's science, everything's combined into that. Uh, it's, it's a, the solar heroic ego is, is intimately intertwined with the, with the image of the divine that, that provided a frame of reference within which the, the, the Western and the modern self developed. Whatever is the image of the divine is in any given moment, in any given culture, is a, is a, 
uh, anticipatory image of what is emerging in the human being. And something huge is emerging right now in the human being by this great transmutation in people's experience of the divine that's taken place in our lifetime. I mean, think how un unthinking was the masculinity of the divine in um, mainstream Western religion universally uh, shared up until the day before yesterday. Uh, and yet how powerful is this sense of, an, of the emerging um, awareness of the feminine dimension of the divine you know, that, that's happened in, in the last 50 years. Um, Jung's answer to Job is a brilliant analysis of, of that and, and, an, and a prophetic anticipation of it. Um, he basically does, he puts God on the couch uh, in answer to Job. He, he's writing this, you know, he's 70 years old. He's got a whole lifetime of deep, you know, psych, psychological work and healing and, uh, and, he, and he does this analysis of the, uh, of the Bible and, and how God, he says, you know, God, when I listen to what, the way you're, you know, justifying how you do this and that in, in, the, in the Bible, uh, it sounds a lot like my psychotic patients. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and the answer to Job is, uh, that is to Job's confrontation with God, is, is uh, the divine feminine. It's, it's Mary, it's Sophia. Uh, that's in, in Jung's uh, answer. It's a, it's a brilliant sort of detective work as well as prophetic um, spiritual work. I think that we can see that in some sense, the reason that we look around the world today, we know how much we need these initiatory rites of passage and they don't exist in our uh, at, at a sufficient level of cultural sanction and, and, and spiritual power in our society and haven't for, for many generations. And think about uh, a point that was being made earlier today, I think by Daniel actually, in thinking about the tremendous um, psychedelic revolution of the 1960s. And, you know, um, one day at Esalen, we, we had a, psyched, a conference on the psychedelics uh, with Stan Groff and Albert Hoffman, who uh, discovered synthesized LSD, uh, Sasha Shulgin, um, who did uh, the recovery of MDMA, ecstasy, many others. Terrence McKenna was there and so forth. And one of the points that I'll never forget, um, Albert Hoffman, who came from Switzerland, uh, he was in his 70s then. He just died now. This is in 1984. He just died uh, very recently, over the age of 100. Um, when I visited him in Switzerland with Stan, uh, not that long ago, a few years ago, I asked him when was the last time he had an LSD experience. He said, well, it was just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Uh, <laughs> He lived up in the Alpine um, meadows and uh, overlooking the French Alps from outside of Basel. And he said, uh, you know, I wanted to greet the spring with, you know, he took a small dose, but he, he just said how much the crucial, what's needed today is the recognition of the soul of nature. Uh, that that's what's been lost to the m modern vision and with such tremendous repercussions, so destructive. But the point that he made back in the uh, mid-80s at this conference, I've never forgotten. He said, you know, he used to call LSD my problem child. And he said he felt the reason that it caused so many social dislocations and there was such a tremendous negative reaction by the, you know, the establishment against it with this kind of panic as it was being misused in many ways. Uh, and he said it's because the West did not have an adequate structure of initiatory uh, sacred rites of passage to be able to accommodate this powerful a sacred medicine. And it is, I mean, it's the most powerful ever discovered. I mean, it's more, you know, it's micrograms. Um, I mean, ayahuasca is just as powerful in, in uh, its, its effect. 
um, its psychological experiential results, but just in terms of pure microgram per microgram, LSD is the most powerful ever, uh, substance um, experientially ever, ever known to the human beings. And this is, this is a, uh, a profound point. Uh, and I believe that as we try to think about why is it that we don't have rites of passage that are adequate, why don't we have sacralized containers of uh, the death rebirth mystery that could serve as vessels for um, individual transformation, which then permits people to tap into the, the anima mundi, into the sacred cosmos. And, uh, we, we live in an uninitiated society as a result of which everyone uh, who's in charge is still adolescent. You know, the, the initiation moves from the, adol moves the adolescent consciousness, the, ch the child adolescent into the, into the spiritually, psychologically mature form of the human being that thinks seven generations hence rather than the immediate uh, satisfaction of the, uh, of, of the ego. And that um, it will, is capable of sustaining the spiritual and material um, life of the community from then on. And when we contemplate why is there that absence, one could say it's because of the um, metaphysical um, blindness uh, or myopia or, or the save us from Newton's sleep, uh, the one eye of uh, the Newtonian uh, Cartesian view, to use Blake's um, term. But it's more than that. If, if we think that ultimately there is a, a deeper intelligence that's at work in all things, not just in everything except for this one sex or this one um, civilization, uh, or this one era, then perhaps something more mysterious is going on. Perhaps a profound um, evolutionary development is taking place in which the reason we don't have initiations is that our entire civilization is going through an initiation and that by not having these initiatory rites of passage as a matter of course uh, for individuals and communities, we've created this kind of global pressure cooker uh, that is right now at an absolutely critical stage. But instead of us being separated from the uh, tribe, from the tribal community, we've been separated from the whole community of, of cosmic life. Uh, from, the, from the anima mundi itself and, and went on our solar uh, individual journey of um, the, the, the modern self and the modern mind, which ends up with that uh, sense of being a stranger in a strange land, of um, the Woody Allen uh, uh, choice that we, we uh, find ourselves in, the Nietzschean is not night closing in on us? Is there still any up or down? Is it not becoming colder? Uh, that's, uh, that's Nietzsche. And he's recognizing the consequences of this destruction of the metaphysical world. And I think the, it, because we are always thinking of, the, of our history and our evolution as a modern heroic ascent, like the sun, conquering the darkness at dawn, rising, going higher and higher in the sky. It's been all ascent, all ascent, all progress. And it left out of the picture the fact that the sun has to go down. The, 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 the sun has to descend. Nietzsche also saw this. He said, I call on all those who are brave enough to go down uh, like the sun. There has to be a descent into the, into the night, the, the, the lunar ground, into the, into the unconscious, into the anima mundi, which is the, the, the crucible of the death rebirth transformation. Into the, the shamanic descent has to happen. And that's what we're doing. 
everybody in this room is, uh, we're all drawn to a conference like this because this is a conference in many ways that's about um, descent and transformation, death and rebirth. Um, yes, there is an apocalyptic uh, scenario that's being played out uh, and um, used to frighten uh, by the media and so forth, but there's also a sense that virtually every person in here, I'm sure, has a deep uh, uh, intuition of that uh, this, this crisis is a, a birth process. A quick point about the, um, the solar self. Um, The Copernican Revolution is a great mystery. What, what a paradox, like Western civilization as a whole, how noble, uh, like humanity as a whole, how like an angel, uh, so noble, so um, uh, in, in reason, in, in movement, in grace, and yet uh, that's Shakespeare's you know, beautiful description in, in Hamlet, but then also like a horde of infamies, uh, man is. That's uh, Calvin. Um, this incredible uh, Western development, where you have the the brilliance of the and nobility of the Renaissance of the um, in in one generation, one short period of. Uh, surrounding the year 1500, you have Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael are all sculpting and painting their masterpieces and um, the printing press is spreading literacy in an unprecedented way and uh, Columbus is sailing west and um, Vasco da Gama sails east and the Magellan expedition circumnavigates the globe, the planets starts opening up to its, 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 itself as a global, a, a planetary era, to use Edgar Morin and Sean Kelly's term. Um, you have, at the same time that this is happening, um, r literally right as Michelangelo is painting God touching Adam on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, um, Martin Luther has his uh, breakthrough and, and, and begins this enormous convulsion of culture called the Protestant Reformation, which comple com completely changes the, the, the field of the, of the modern self, but also of the modern world, the pluralistic, secular, um, multi-religious, uh, all that is made possible as a result of the uh, Reformation that breaks out of the Catholic imperium. Uh, but at the same moment that's happening, and this is, we have like right within the same months, Copernicus has the heliocentric uh, uh, theory come to him and, and the, he writes that first small paper that circulates it around a few friends um, 30 years before he publishes De Revolutionibus in 1513, um, 1514. So uh, all that happened all those things that I just described, from you know, Leonardo to Copernicus and the global explorations and the conquistador, uh, all, the, the printing press, all that's happening in less time than, than has elapsed uh, since Woodstock and the moon landing. Um, it, that was, I think of it as um, the crowning, um, you know, in the sense of birth crowning, that's when the modern, self was crowning in, in, in the birth. You just start seeing the crown of the baby coming out. Uh, that's, that's the beginning. And we're right now at a, a, another major stage in this, in, the, in this birth process. And yet given all that um, dynamic luminosity of our civilization and also this powerful shadow that it has cast. And the particular role that the Copernican Revolution played in deconstructing the old sacred cosmos centered on the earth with, all the, with, the, with the planets and the stars, uh, expressions of, of the divine, of the gods, of the divine will, um, 
all that is is shattered, and there's and the the Earth is seen as moving, and it's moving around the sun, and this that was the in many ways how the, where the disenchantment of the modern cosmos begins, but at the same time it takes place as a um, decentering of the human being from the center of the universe, which, as many moderns have pointed out, we're the first to really recognize that, um, to not live in the delusion that man is the center of the cosmos. So we, from this point of view, we are the brave, um, we have the braveness and clarity of mind to, to see that we are just a speck of dust moving around uh, on a planet, moving around one sun amongst billions of suns and so forth. So that we have this kind of modesty, this humility, compared with all these, every previous um, society, uh, the primitive tribes and so forth, they all lived in this delusion of being so important and they, they were the center. And I've always had a problem. Why, why does that not sound very humble? Um, and, <laughs> And why do all the geocentric, the, 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 all the indigenous societies that saw the earth as central and as not moving, why do they seem to have often a much more um, relational connection to the whole, less filled with hubris? Uh, and it took me a long time to, to um, figure this out, and one day I, was, I read a New York Times column by uh, Anna Quinlan, who used to write for the Times, and it was Mother's Day. She was an, uh, a mother of two young children, and she was writing uh, from San Francisco while her two little children were still in New York, and she wanted to somehow describe what that was like to be separated from her two little children, but also how the two little children felt about it. And in one little phrase, it suddenly, I got the, the kind of cosmological ramifications of it. She said, the center of the child's universe is the mother. And I thought, well, that's right. It's not, the center of the child's universe is not the child, it's the mother. And that, and the center of all the pre-modern and non-Western um, cultures in their cosmology, it's not that the human being was the be all end all center of the cosmos. The earth was and the and the the human being was embedded in the earth as the earth was embedded in the cosmos that was, all of which was ensouled. And the human being had a more it was it was almost like more in the womb of the whole. And uh, the animals were kindred, or brothers and sisters and so forth. It was a very different relationship to the whole. Now, and that made me realize that what happened with the modern mind when the Copernican revolution, this absolutely brilliant breakthrough, I mean really in many ways, uh, I agree with Goethe when he says in some ways it's the greatest um, breakthrough of, uh, intellectually of, of, of all time. He said, greater than the Bible, which was a lot to say back in 1800. And um, what happened was that there was a powerful disconnection that the modern mind and modern self did from the earth. Uh, we have a term in psychology called cathexis and decathecting. Like when you decathect from, okay, cathexis would be uh, like the flow of emotional um, and mental energy towards someone, like if you're in love with somebody or the, the child's uh, feelings about the mother, there's a cathexis there. It's a f powerful flow of, of emotional energy of eros and so forth. When one falls out of love, that's one decathex. Okay, it's Freud that brought that term in. Well, the modern mind in some sense went through a profound decathecting from the earth at that moment Carolyn Merchant talks about it in that book called The, the Death of Nature. And there was a cathexis to a, a, uh, an identifying with the sun, with the solar logos, 
with the divine light that was the, the new center. The modern mind and the modern self identified itself as being, it had so brilliantly understood the nature of the cosmos now and everything about the empowerment of modern technology and modern scientific knowledge and the empowerment of the modern self fed this sense of, of solar empowerment. That moment that Michelangelo's God is touching Adam and that Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo are getting the, um, and Newton are getting the heliocentric uh, breakthrough and the Renaissance self is being born. This is a moment of tremendous solar empowerment, almost like a divine influx is coming in and uh, we're all the beneficiaries of that. We're all walking around with solar power inside us of selfhood, of autonomous selfhood that is significant to us. But we're also all living with the consequences of that too. And there's an, the enormous responsibility that comes with that. Um, and with the cosmological disenchantment that comes with it. There's a great cartoon uh, that Calvin and Hobbes uh, did, um, well, this is different. This isn't the Jean Calvin uh, and Thomas Hobbes. Of the, <laughs> this is, I think, you know, Bill Watterson's great uh, cartoons. I imagine a good number of you will, will remember. We, he stopped doing this about 20 years ago, but it was just absolutely brilliant, maybe 15 years ago. Um, so little Calvin, uh, six years old, whatever he is, this kind of hyper-articulate, postmodern, Dennis the Menace kind of uh, cartoon figure. So he's looking up at the night sky in the first image, just silently looking at the night sky, this little. And then in the second image, he says with huge letters, I'm significant. <laughs> and then in the third image, he doesn't say anything. Of course, the night sky doesn't say anything, starry sky. And then in the fourth image, in tiny little letters, Calvin says, screamed the dust speck. Oh. <laughs> and that captures exactly the modern state of cosmological existential alienation. And it's the, it's the other side of the inflated sense of selfhood that the modern self had. So, it's funny how like a cartoonist can just nail something like that with just a few, just a few images. It's, this is the price of being all I and no thou. Mm -hmm. of, uh, it's, we see it every time you see another Hollywood star or corporate CEO or dictator who's surrounded only by adoring or, yet, or scared yes men and women um, uh, and who just it's all radiant egocentricity that's pushing out. There's no relational matrix that disciplines and transforms the self. So it becomes pathologically tyrannical. And, in, um, and then you get the sort of, you know, Mel Gibson uh, or uh, um, other monstrous egos just that they, they, they get out of control. And this is, this is the price of either great, tremendous wealth, tremendous um, uh, power, um, uh, uh, fame and so forth. These, it's, it's a real, this is the absolute importance of, of the partner, of the spouse, of the friend, of the peer uh, that, that can um, serve as that relational um, containing matrix that continuous, continuously it's, it's allows the, the full solar and lunar um, polarity to interact and, and you don't get that one-sidedness of the solar principle. And that's what in many ways is the crisis of, of, of modernity, that one-sided solar development of it being all I and no thou. And just as the modern mind thought that it could brilliantly shine the light of scientific reason on every part of the cosmos, illuminate it and understand it and objectively grasp it and exploit it to serve human benefit. That was the, um, 
that was the inflation of identifying with the, the, sol the, the sun, the solar logos, and losing a connection with the ground of the earth and of the ins of ensouled nature. And the cure for that is a descent, a shamanic descent, a transfiguration, a transformation, a deconstruction of the old self. But that's also, uh, also part of the cure is listening. Like what, what, the, what the lunar part of ourselves does, the way a mother does with a child, which is listen. Um, uh, the capacity to listen and not always be the, the solar um, radiant uh, centrifugal force, but to be able to start listening to the other sources of wisdom that humanity has. All those cultures that were just regarded as primitive, but have absolutely crucial keys to our future. Um, our capacity to listen to our dreams, to listen to our intuitions, to listen to our body, to listen to each other, um, to constantly be um, correcting the one-sidedness of, of our uh, narrow consciousness. The capacity to listen to those subtle patterns of our lives that express themselves in synchronicities. Synchronicities are like these, um, these kind of gifts of grace that, that suddenly emerge and give us a little sense of something more uh, is going on than the random um, uh, environment that we were taught exists. This is, it's like that scene in, um, you know, in the movie, uh, Oh, I hate it when uh, Pleasantville, um, where the the it's a black and white world, but then the little intimations of color, that's the intimations of something more of a deeper soul intelligence and purpose is at work in life than uh, the, than a purely random universe. It's that we're not alone. There's something larger. There's a, we are participating in a larger field of intelligence and spirit uh, that pervades the cosmos and that can awaken us out of this delusion that somehow we human beings are the one form of the cosmos that is uh, conscious and that has, that we are this absolute oddity of consciousness in a random, unconscious, purposeless universe. Once you get a sense for how absurd that is, it, um, it suddenly seems almost unimaginable how it, it was so compelling a, a conviction, but it still is running, in many ways, the worldview of a BP, uh, uh, of a, um, uh, the, the mainstream uh, universities are still under that, under that constraint. Let me bring in one other elder and then say a quick thing about the, the uh, planetary alignments. This is um, the great Thomas Berry. Um, we need a spirituality that emerges out of a reality deeper than ourselves, even deeper than life a spirituality that is as deep as the earth process itself, a spirituality born out of the solar system, and even out of the heavens beyond the solar system. There in the stars is where the primordial elements take shape in both their physical and psychic soul aspects. There is a certain triviality in any spiritual discipline that does not experience itself as supported by the spiritual as well as the physical dynamics of the entire cosmic earth process. A spirituality is a mode of being in which not only the divine and the human commune with each other, but we discover ourselves in the universe and the universe discovers itself in us. That's a beautiful statement of the participatory worldview. Uh, there's echoes of Rudolf Steiner in there, um, but it is also uh, very much a kind of prophetic awareness of a, the, 
the absolute need to reconnect to the sacredness of, uh, of the earth that Thomas Berry in particular brought to the Western religions as a Catholic priest himself. A, a few words uh, quickly about the, um, the outer planets. You see, we're, when we are trying to assess something like the um, solstice, the winter solstice lining up with the, the galactic center, um, we're, we're handicapped by the fact that we don't have any em, empirical, historical, we can't look back at, well, here's what happened the last six times that's gone on, so we can see a pattern. We don't, we, we only have a kind of uh, intuitive or prophetic uh, um, divinatory way of knowing in relationship to that. But in, in, in terms of the um, movements of the planets, and by, I will also include the, uh, those bodies discovered in the modern period uh, named Uranus, uh, Neptune, and Pluto, which we have, the, those are the three um, bodies of the, in the solar system for which past Saturn, we have the, uh, both the most, um, we have a, a, a complete consensus about their archetypal meanings among the uh, contemporary astrologi Western astrological community, uh, but also uh, we also have such excellent um, astronomical data and historical correlations, biographical correlations, and so forth. My work in this respect, by the way, comes out of the psychological um, field, start, starting with work that Stan Groff and I did 35 years ago, started then at Esalen, where we were tracking carefully the, uh, to our astonishment, we discovered that there was a, a consistent correlation between the kinds of experiences people were having during uh, psychedelic uh, sessions and spiritual emergencies and uh, any kind of powerful experiential uh, work. And their uh, people's transits, that is the planetary transits of their natal chart, that that, that there was an archetypal, um, that knowing the transits was the most powerful method for understanding the archetypal patterning of the experience. And none of the psychological tests that were attempted like the MMPI or the Rorschach uh, thematic apperception test had any value predictively. So um, that's where this research originally came out of, but eventually it's extended to the whole historical collective um, uh, field. And for those of you who are interested, there's a journal of archetypal cosmology called Archai. A-R-C-H-A-I, that's online and it's free. So it's called archaijournal.org. Archai is the Greek word, A-R-C-H-A-I. If you go to archaijournal.org. And um, the, there'll be a summary in the next month or so for the next issue, the second issue. I've done a summary of the outer planet um, alignments of our time, particularly from 2000 to 2020. And uh, let me just say by way of a very brief summation here that the, the Saturn, Uranus, Pluto, T-square that we're going through right now, um, which basically goes from about 2007 or eight right up to 2012, I mean, the years that it's most intensely aligned, uh, closely tightly aligned, is 2008 to 11. But the larger orb is really the, 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 the whole five, six year period, 2007 to 2012. This is a very, very, just historically, if we look when, when those three planets, these are basically three cycles have come into, converged in our time. Um, and, it's a very powerful one. This is the first uh, line, uh, what's called, dynamic alignment of Uranus and Pluto since the 1960s, and it's that same type of energy, this tremendous Plutonic uh, Dionysian empowerment of the Promethean principle of radical change and freedom and, and uh, uh, powerful turmoil and transformation. Uh, 
with the Saturn in there too, the clash of opposites is just terrific between the old and the new, uh, between the future and the past, between the conservative and the progressive, tremendous clash of opposites and tension of opposites. Um, and there's only been two T-squares in the last 200 years of those three planets, and they both coincided with global economic collapses, 1929 to 33 was the last one, and the one before that was the uh, 1873 to 76 period, which economists point to as the other worldwide depression that this one most resembles. Um, so collapsing structures are very typical for this, but we're uh, also the tension of opposites, the uh, a tendency for there to be um, technological, uh, uh, breakdowns, collapses of all sorts of structures, separative impulses. But at the same time, it's a period of tremendous uh, potential for radical change as the, the 1960s, which had that Uranus-Pluto conjunction, the only conjunction of those two planets uh, in the 20th century. In many ways, you could say we're, we've got, it's a kind of combination of the 1960s and the 1930s, what we're going through right now. Um, and the Uranus-Pluto alignment will go all the way to 2020. Uh, it's a long square. And so while this more tense, I, I would say in many ways this T-square is the, is the defining moment uh, of a five-year period, a kind of eye of the needle of um, a kind of e ego death of an old way of being. Structures, corporate structures, governmental structures, patriarchal structures, psychological, relational, marital, all sorts of structures are being tested, collapsing, um, that which is, and, and others are, uh, n if I were to summarize this T-square in a single sentence, which is uh, obviously gonna be too simplistic, um, but at least gestures at this impulse that it's work that is at work. I would describe it as intense volcanic evolutionary pressures to radically reconfigure all life structures. Um, I mean that. I mean that. That's literally what those archetypes have to do with Pluto, Uranus, and Saturn. And it's very uh, so. Uh, this year in particular, we have right now a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, which lasts about 14 months. It'll go all the way through next spring. It tends to coincide with ex quite uh, exciting new beginnings, creative breakthroughs, um, unexpected births. It's, a, it's an extraordinary, oh, and Jupiter and Uranus were conjunct in 68 and 69, for example, um, with the moon landing and Woodstock and all that. Uh, it was. Um, they were lined up also in, at the time of the Berlin Wall falling and the Velvet Revolution uh, and Nelson Mandela come, uh, being released and so forth. It's, it's an amazing, uh, uh, I mean, it's, those happened to be when there were three planets lined up, uh, so they were especially powerful versions of it. But, but in this next issue of Archi, I will give the, you can see this more concise summary of what's ha happened in the last several years and what, what kind of archetypal energies we're looking at coming forward. And I would just say that it looks to me as if this period right now is really, I mean, so much depends on what we, what we bring to the table. These things are not predetermined by, in my estimation, by some, uh, the, these are powerful archetypal forces. The more conscious we are in participating intelligently with them, the less we are going to be puppets of them acting out in more destructive ways. So, so much depends on our consciousness and what we bring to the, um, to the um, drama. Uh, and after it's over, after the T-square is over, this Uranus-Pluto energy will continue for um, you know, the rest of the, this next decade. And while it is still, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic, intense and often stressful energy, there's tremendous potential for an accelerated change and um, the birth of a, of a new, um, 
new horizons tend to open up with great rapidity. Um, and if I were to um, think of a particular single sentence that I think most um, is helpful to remember, it's a beautiful sentence that Friedrich Nietzsche used in the last year of his life, well, the last year of his um, writing life while he, he, his sanity was still intact and he was so um, vividly eloquent. And he was trying, he summarized in a single sentence the mystery of the, or the, the, tr the insight of the, of the ancient um, mystery religions. What he said could also be said, it's, the, it's really the essence of Christianity as well and the whole Judeo Christian um, tradition. All pain is birth pain. All pain is birth pain. As soon as one grasps that, everything changes. And how we experience suffering ourselves in our lives, how we uh, engage with a greater sense of trust in the, in the process of the whole is completely um, transformed. All pain is birth pain. Okay, thanks a lot.